Before this episode starts, I'd like to tell you about a book giveaway. It's the amazing story of a US 23-year-old who smuggled the music of the Soviet underground to the West in order to produce the groundbreaking album Red Wave for underground bands from the USSR. For how to be in with a chance to win the book, check out details in the show notes of every Cold War Conversations episode. Now, back to this episode. Also by this time, I had had you know, a meeting with the FBI who also thought I was a spy like the KGB and would try to scare me by telling me that the KGB could plant drugs or other things on me that then they could catch me and then I'd be coerced into working for them. This is Cold War Conversations. Thanks to Patreon Jesse Pollard for our intro today. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app so you don't miss out on future episodes. This is the second part of our chat with Joanna Stingray, who was only 23 years old when she first set foot in the Soviet Union and started meeting now legendary musicians and artists of the Soviet underground. By 1985, she was writing and recording with them and smuggling their music to the West in order to produce the groundbreaking album Red Wave, four underground bands from the USSR. In this part, we hear about her questioning by the KGB and the FBI, falling in love with Yuri, and how she smuggled the band's music out of the Soviet Union to produce the Red Wave album. Joanna's book Red Wave, written by her singer-songwriter daughter Madison, includes Stingray's extensive collection of photographs, artworks and interviews with the musicians. There's details in our episode notes. If you've listened this far, I know that you are enjoying the podcast, so I'm asking for donations to support my work and enable me to continue producing it. If you become a monthly supporter, you will get the sought-after Cold War Conversations coaster as a thank you and bask in the warm glow of knowing that you're helping to preserve Cold War history. Still not sure? Here's one of our financial supporters. I'm Tim from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I support the Cold War Conversations podcast financially because of the great research and the quality of the storytelling. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If a financial contribution is not your cup of tea, then you can still help us by leaving written reviews wherever you listen to us, as well as sharing us on social media. It really helps us get new guests on the show. So, back to today's episode, I'm delighted to welcome Joanna Stingray to our Cold War conversation. And out of nowhere, two guys grab each of my arms and shoulders and drag me off to the left. And again, it was, it was ineffable, the experience, because I don't even know what happened. From one moment, I'm, I, I'm moving forward. The next moment, with the help of two guys holding me, I'm moving completely to the side, being dragged away from this crowd, and then down these stairs to this room. And what was baffling, that not one person in the crowd turned to look at what's going on. Again, it was the sense, if I don't look, I'm not part of it. I didn't see anything. I don't know anything. And, and so that, that, again, was just part of how you survived and how life was in the Soviet Union. And the next thing I know, I'm in this room downstairs and some guy is, you know, I felt like he was screaming, but asking me in an aggressive voice uh, things in Russian. And again, I, I didn't understand him. And I kept saying, I don't speak Russian. I don't speak Russian. But for a long time, I don't think they believed me. After some time, I guess they realized, I guess she doesn't speak Russian. I think they assumed that I was a foreigner, probably from Europe, studying in Russia, studying Russian at the university. Uh, and then when they figured out that, that I guess that's not who I was, they said, in English, your name, your name. I was so nervous. And by, by this time, my whole life was in Russia. 
And I always had in the back of my head that I, I was always afraid I was going to get my visa declined and be cut off from this lifeline that I had become embedded in. And I don't know why or where I got the nerve to not answer him and tell him my name, but somehow the words came out of my mouth, tell me who you are, show me who you are, and I'll tell you my name. I, I just can't believe to this day that that's actually what I said because I was, I was, you know, shaking. I was so nervous. I think the guy was a little bit surprised by my answer that I didn't answer him. So he went on to saying, how did, how did you get here? Who brought you? And he started naming some of the musicians names. Who did I know? Again, I didn't want to get them in trouble. And I said, no, no, I, I, I don't know them. I just, I just came to the concert. I just came to the concert and then again, they go back to asking my name and asking my name again. I, I just in my head thought if I tell them my name, I'm never going to get another visa. So I blurted out, I'm an American. If you want to know about me, contact the American consulate. And there was a, an American consulate in Leningrad at that time. And again, the guy kind of stiffened up, like just so surprised that I was being so bold and he paused for a second and said, go, and pointed to the door. And I, I just kind of froze. I wasn't sure. But then I just ran out. I wanted to get out there so badly. So I, I went out on the street, and that was my, my first experience with the KGB. And it was quite, quite, quite frightening. But, but I, I, I got out, and uh, it was a memorable moment for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that's an incredible story. How long do you think they were holding you for? You know, I think it felt a lot longer than it was. It probably was only five or 10 minutes. You know, for me, it was, it was an indelible experience and uh, one that weighed on me heavily. But once I got out in the street, uh, I, I started walking up the block. I had no idea where my sister was. Was she taken and she in another room? I didn't know. Um, a girl ran up to me and said, uh, Boris said to meet us at this address later, walk around and get rid of, you're being followed, get rid of them, walk around a while and meet us at this address for a party. She tells me the address before I can ask her a question, you know, where's my sister? She's disappeared, which again is very typical. So I spend the next kind of, I don't know. It's, it felt like hours. It was probably only a half an hour walking around the streets of Leningrad. And when I would turn around, a guy would quickly put his head down or look at a street light. And again, I, I, it felt comical. Like I was in, you know, a, a KGB spy thriller in the States. It was exactly how it was portrayed in the films that we had seen here. Um, and I, I couldn't believe it. Like he's being so obvious. Of course, you know, in hindsight, he realized they knew they were being obvious. They knew that I knew they were following me, but it was them sending me a message, trying to scare me that I should not be part of these circles. Um, when I finally got rid of him and somehow managed to find this address and apartment uh, where the party was, uh, you know, Boris opens the door. Hi, come in. Are you? Uh, what happened? And when I'm telling my story as if it's horrific, I could tell all of them and they're like, welcome to our lives. You know, they took it all with a grain of salt. This is what we had to deal with. In fact, after my sister and I left that party at that flat that night, the KGB showed up and questioned the people that lived there, you know, about why were there Americans here, blah, blah, blah. So again, this was, again, part of what they accepted was part of their lives and they just went with it. So over time, without consciously doing it, I kind of ended up becoming like that, where where I could just deal with these hardships and deal with these difficulties as if it's just another speed bump, just get over it. And it was great because it started to give me layers to who I was. You know, the way you're describing this is is brilliant because it really does paint a picture. And I appreciate you taking your time to you know, tell me in quite a lot of detail what went on. Now, I think you, you start spending more time with the guys from Kino uh, and particularly uh, a young fella called Yuri. Yes. <laughs> 
So Yuri is the guitar player from Kino that the first time I saw his face, everything just stopped and, and my heart was beating. And, you know, bring, being brought up in, in the U.S. and the Disney films, I believe that when everything stopped and your heart was beating so loudly, it meant you had found your prince. And this means this is the one person you're supposed to be with and you're going to be with them forever. This is your, you know, your, your, your uh, Prince Charming. And I just was crazy about him. And he was attractive to me as well. And the interesting thing was that neither of us spoke each other's language. Um, Victor, the leader of his band, who he and I, when we first met, had an instant connection as if we were old friends. It was just very, very easygoing and felt very natural. Victor did speak some English. So he was with Yuri and I, most of the time, we became this happy threesome. And, uh, you know, it just kind of started with this, uh, you know, energetic connection. And it became a relationship. And, you know, we tried to spend time together. Again, we couldn't really speak, but there was, there was just something pulling me t- to him that I could not be with him. And as time went on, it became more serious and more serious. I started spending more time at his apartment, which was outside of the center of the city. So in the center, it was very hard to have your own apartment. Most people in the center were living in communal flats like Boris. Only if you were well-connected could you somehow finagle a private apartment for your own family. So more people that have private apartments were these kind of places, these huge, tall buildings, they look like tenement buildings that I'd seen in New York, where they're in these big circles with like a little play area in the center. And they were about 40 minutes out of the center of Leningrad. Yuri lived in Kupchina, Victor Tse also lived out there. Gustav, the drummer in the band also did. A lot of the musicians lived out. Um, Again, it was very difficult, almost impossible to have an apartment on your own. So Yuri lived with his parents. So there were three rooms in the whole apartment, one small bathroom with three people. And I would start to spend more and more time there. And again, the same behavior of every time I was there, his parents weren't there. Or when I was in Yuri's room with the door closed, I would hear them out there. But the minute I would come out, they they were gone. This whole kind of, we don't see you. We don't know what American. Again, I started to sleep there on occasion to just leave the tours and start to sleep there. And it was as if there were little mice running around at night because we'd wake up and there would be breakfast or a beautiful cake that his mother would make. But I never, ever saw them. It was this kind of just interesting existence that here's Yuri and I in the apartment and supposedly some parents somewhere. But that's the way life was. I was just going to ask you. I mean, th- these guys are are in underground bands, so they they're not earning much money, if any money, from these gigs. How did they make a living? What did they have day jobs? Yes. So in communism, under communism, everybody has to have a job. Not only men, but women, which was interesting because in the seventies uh, and eighties in America, I knew very few women mothers that had worked and my mother because she got divorced was working and I remember how shameful it felt at school when people heard that my mother had a job working at the you know Wilson's house of suede for me it was horrific but in Russia everybody worked and so that was something different um the bands because they were amateur and it wasn't their official job could not make money from their music made very little and officially had to have other what were considered real jobs. Most of them would take the jobs at at the bottom of the the ring, which paid the least amount, but that you didn't have to do every day. Boris was a night watchman. Maybe he had to work 24 hours every uh, seven days. Um, Victor, many of the other musicians worked at a building shoveling coal to heat the apartment building. It was later nicknamed Kamchatka. Um, again, could work 24 hours and then have six or seven days off. Um, Yuri was working in some boiler place, again, where he was doing something, but he had to work more days a week. His parents were were scientists. And so they, you know, expected him to have, I don't know, you know, more of a real job or more days, which is why 
even in the Kino music video I made later, you know, Yuri's not there. He, he had uh, more days he had to work. But they did kind of do these odd jobs on the side just to, you know, have, have the official job to be okay. Certainly nobody was into it. A lot of them would miss work, um, you know, and, and kind of just want to do their music. How did the idea of bringing their music to the U.S. come about? So it all happened very organically. Um, even after the first trip, I came back and I really became like a missionary. I, I couldn't stop talking about what I had seen there. And I got the same reaction from people as I had when they told me there was rock in Russia. They all were laughing, saying, there's no rock in Russia. And then I would show them after the second trip some photos of the rockers and or I would play them some of their music. And I saw quite quickly how powerful a tool I had to open up Americans' eyes. Because right away they said, oh my gosh, yeah, they do look cool. Wow, look at that. Or, oh, this music's hip. So I, I, I just started realizing that I could actually do something uh, with this music to change people's opinions of this place because I had fallen so in love with it. And to hear people say bad things about Russia, uh, you know, I was in line at Disneyland and there was a group of young boys in front of me. And I said, what do you guys think of Russia? And immediately they said, ah, we have to bomb them. We have to get rid of them. We have to bomb them. So, you know, that really touched me and hurt my feelings and thought they don't know what I know. If they would, if they could see this, they wouldn't feel that way. So my first idea was to put out an album of Boris's music. I, continued to be in touch with Bowie through his office. He was interested in helping either writing something on the album or giving me some context to record companies. So that was the road I was on. And then when it started to uh, actually turn into something, I realized that the album I put out would be the first glimpse that Americans saw of real Russian rock in Russia, then maybe I should give them more than one band. So I thought of, of making it a double album and putting four bands on. And I had a discussion with Boris and said, what do you think about this? And do you want to help me do this? And he was on board and said, I think it's a great idea. So Boris and I together kind of came up with the whole concept of Red Wave, that there would be four bands. Each band would get a side, which would be five or six songs. And of course, it was going to be Aquarium. Of course, it was going to be Kino by then because I was close with them. Uh, we decided on Strange Games because I had become close with them through Boris. And the last band we decided on was Elisa. And we decided on Elisa because they were a new band. Costa Kinchev, the singer, had moved from Moscow to Leningrad. It was a little easier to be an underground band in Leningrad in Moscow because Moscow is the political center in the Kremlin. So they cracked down a little harder in Moscow. Um, but I saw Lisa at one of the rock club festivals and he was just an electric performer. You know, he was kind of like a Billy Idol mixed with Freddie Mercury and he would move and twist his body and everybody, including me, would just melt. I mean, it was like exhausting to watch him because he would drain everything out of you. Um, so we picked him as the fourth band. It was just a good compliment to the other three that it kind of was four different styles. So I felt really good about the representation of what I was putting out. And the next thing was to get the record contract. And I first went to the big record companies through either Bowie's contacts or other contacts I personally had. And I had a meeting with the head of Warner Brothers, I had a meeting with the head of Capitol Records. When I found out very quickly that it wasn't hard to sell the bands and the idea, everybody was just kind of pleasantly surprised by what they saw and knew that this would gain attention. Um, so it wasn't a hard sell on, on my side. What was the difficulty with the big record companies was, okay, we, we love this, we want to do this, okay, but what's going on with the copyright and the royalties. And they had a really hard time comprehending that these are underground bands. They're not recognized by the government. So they own their own music. They're free because there's no ties to anything. And to them, they were nervous because they didn't want to have any backlash. 
And what I understood a little while after that is that all of these big record companies in the West had big contracts with Melodia for all of the Russian classical music. And that those were big buck contracts and brought in a lot of money. And they didn't want to risk that by putting out some Russian rock that could turn into a lawsuit with the Russians or maybe have the Russians, you know, cancel their classical contracts. So I understood that. I, I still felt good because I saw how enthusiastic they were by the bands and the music. I eventually got to Big Time Records, which was a small record label from Australia that had an office on Hollywood and Highland. And, you know, much messier. And the head of it was dressed in T-shirt and jeans. The vibe kind of fit with who these rockers were. Because, again, these rockers to me were just completely pure organic rockers because they couldn't make any money. They couldn't record. They couldn't play in big halls or anything. So they were doing it because they had to. This was who they were. Their music was part of their essence and, and they had to express it. So it felt like a good match to be with this independent small label who said, okay, big deal if we get in trouble, little publicity never hurt anybody. And that was where we, we put together the album of Red Wave. And uh, it took about eight months to almost a year to get everything I needed from the bands I wanted to get their lyrics to put on the inserts in Russian and translated into English. I wanted tons of photos so they could see how, how cool these rockers all looked. And I had to get their tapes out. Of course, uh, you know, this was not easy. I, so it took most of 1985 to get everything out. This is still communism in Russia. Gorbachev comes in in 85 but he really doesn't start doing anything till 86. So 85 was still, you know, a, a real uh, living under communism and dealing with it. So trying to figure out how to get this stuff out and not get in trouble or caught taking it out uh, wasn't easy. And again, I wasn't smuggling drugs out, but when you're smuggling something hidden under the inserts in your shoes or hidden in different compartments in your suitcase or hidden in zippered pockets in your back of your jacket, if you get caught, you're caught for smuggling. So it didn't matter that it wasn't something like drugs. It was still, you know, a, a huge weight and would make me sweat getting it out. Also, by this time, I had had, you know, a meeting with the FBI who also thought I was a spy like the KGB and would try to scare me by telling me that the KGB could plant drugs or other things on me, that then they could catch me and then I'd be coerced into working for them. So again, I, I had all of this um, danger surrounding me, weighing on me, but I was so passionate and so young and naive and driven and fearless. You know, when you're young, you're fearless because you're, you're not thinking straight and you don't have the responsibilities of a family or thinking too deeply about your family at home or whatever. So one way or another, I just kind of improvised the way my friends did and figured out how to sneak things, put things, talk my way, you know, through customs and miraculously over uh, close to a year, we got everything out that we needed for the album. And the album was released uh, 35 years ago this June. So it was released June 27, uh, 1986. Wow. Wow. That's a neat coincidence for us uh, <laughs> yeah. chatting today. Um, the, the FBI, I, th I think I remember reading in the book, you, you checked the file 20 years later. What, what did it say about you? You know, it, it, it said a lot of interesting things. It said that I, you know, didn't want to disclose the name of a Russian immigrant that I was talking about in New York. Um, and that that person told me, be careful to meet with the FBI because that'll piss off the KGB. You know, they wrote how they had advised me to be careful that the Soviets could plant things on me and coerce me to work with them. The most interesting, I ended up meeting with them two times. Both times I tried to explain to them Nope, I, I'm, I'm just dealing with these musicians. I want to help Americans understand there's another side to Russia. What I learned very quickly with my meetings with the FBI and with the KGB 
is that they basically were tra- trained at the same university. <laughs> they had tunnel vision. And when they saw red flags that told them this person must be a spy, they could not get their mind off of that. Now, I understand an American in 1984 going in and out of Russia every three months is a huge red flag. I get that. Their unwillingness on both sides to to try to listen to me and to see that there could possibly be some other reason for me going back and forth besides being a spy, you know, they just, they weren't open to it. They, They were so similar. They were also similar in how they got to me to speak to me. Both sides wanted to know if I was a spy. They would not call me up saying, we need to meet with you. We think you're a spy. What's your answer? Explain. If you say no, why not? They wouldn't do that. It's all set up in a very securitous way. And they both come up with these scenarios and these these ways of getting to me that are not the real reason. So, uh, you know, to me, it was it was unnerving, but it was also funny, you know, that that they seem to be, you know, working from the same handbook. Um, The most interesting is after I met the second time with the uh, FBI and showed her the album cover was coming out. And she looked it over and I said, I told you all along, it's only music. This is coming out in two weeks. I told you, you know, we finally end that meeting. And I think that's it. I'm not going to see them again. What was interesting about reading my file that time months after that, they are still um, surveying me and following me. And they write up in this report that it is possible I could already be working for the Soviets. And and that, when I got my report, was probably the most surprising that even after that and showing the album, seeing all the press the album got in the States, they still thought that I, I was could be working with the Soviets. Unbelievable. Incredible. Incredible. How, how was the album received in the States? You know, it was amazing because it was the first side of Russia shown that had something hip, that it was about culture, something that we could identify with. It, it blew up in the press. And it was not only the music press, Rolling Stone and all of that. It was in you know Newsweek and Time. Everybody wanted to interview me about this album. It was it was so huge on the on the press level of wanting to write about it. And, and put it on the news and, and different kind of programs. I mean, we, we just couldn't turn people away. From morning till night, I was doing interviews. It was unbelievable. People thought it was the most amazing thing they'd ever seen. And for me, you know, who had been acting like a missionary, uh, you know, what more could I ask for? Everywhere it was written up, being talked about, it was incredible. Um, people were astonished by what they saw. And again, by, by now... Uh, the Americans, as the British and the world, had gotten a glimpse in the We Are the World concert that I think was a couple of years before that. There was that band that was somehow videotaped in from Russia, an official band autograph that was so outdated and awful rock music that the whole world had laughed about it. So when I had been trying to tell people about this Russian rock, they said, no, 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 we've seen autograph. We know, we know Russia's an embarrassment. There's no rock there. So to have all of this press about my guys out there and being reviewed that this was quite impressive rock. I made a music video for each band that was played on MTV. I couldn't have asked for more. I think in the end, they sold 20,000 of the double albums in America. Then it came out, it was released in England. It was really amazing because it was being sung in Russian. So it could only go so far because, you know, people do need to understand the lyrics. Um, but it was a success in every sense of the word. I, I was so happy. It gave my life meaning. And I felt like I did something so important. And when I really did the record, I originally really thought I was doing it to open up the eyes of the Americans. In the end, I realized I was doing it to make my friends proud and to to make their fans in Russia um, just thrilled that I had cemented kind of that these were worthy and real rock bands. So all of this press in the West did that. So for me, it was so fulfilling that I could do this for my friends because by now they had changed my life. 
they had made me understand what life was about. And, you know, I came to Russia thinking, you know, I'm from America, so I'm free. These people, these poor people aren't free. And what I really learned and saw in Russia that freedom is not so much about the laws where you live and how free you are as a person compared to what laws, what you can and cannot do in your country. That's not what the word freedom really means. What I learned from my friends in Russia was that freedom of spirit is what is important. Freedom of spirit is what we're all searching for. And they gave me that. So for me, I was just so um, completed that I could do something for them. And putting out Red Wave was a gift for them. If you're listening this far, I know that you are enjoying the content and I could use your support to help me to find the time to continue to capture these amazing stories and preserve them. If you'd like to support me with this project, then head over to coldwarconversations.com slash donate and check out the options. Now back to today's episode. The the guys in the Soviet Union haven't seen the album yet. So in eighty six, you cross into the Soviet Union via Helsinki. Now, tell me about that border crossing. Yes. So we're trying to get back for the first time before the album's released. I have the album cover to show them so they can actually see that it's real because the whole time getting their stuff out, I'm not sure they ever believed it was really going to happen. You know, they were so used to things in Russia being promised that never happened. That's just part of, you know, the Soviet way. Um, So my sister and I decided to go in through Helsinki thinking it might be easier because we are bringing back tons of equipment. That's the only thing they ever asked for. Um, All of the musicians uh, complained about the lack of equipment. It was the only thing they really ever craved. So we had gotten equipment um, from Yamaha, big keyboards and drum machines. And I got more guitars and basses and bought more stuff and even bought, you know, punk bracelets, things that I could buy for a dollar on Melrose in Los Angeles, this whole punk area at the time to them was like giving them, you know, a jewel. So we had so much stuff. We thought we heard it might be easier to drive in from Helsinki. So There we are landing in Helsinki, renting a car with the huge sign that says, you are not allowed to take our rental cars anywhere out of of Finland. You cannot drive them anywhere else, especially into any Soviet country. And we pack it up with stuff sticking out left and right. My sister has a guitar in the middle of her legs in front of her face in the car. And here the two naive Americans go driving off towards the Soviet border. And it's beautiful. There's nobody around and it's just forest and greenery. And and we're just enjoying and playing music and driving through. And all of a sudden you hit an area where the trees are all cut down and it looks barren. And and you see one of those kind of um, uh, lookouts, like a military lookout and the vibe changes and we start to get nervous. And we're bringing all this equipment in. Again, not really any plan what we're going to say. I had given my sister some documents uh, that the record company wanted the musicians to sign, saying they gave me the rights to put their music out. And she's holding that. And we're coming up, and it's just eerie and eerie, and, and the air just feels thicker. And we come up to the border, and we see there's only one car in front of us that has been kind of dismantled, this car. And as we're pulling up, my sister takes these papers out of wherever she had them. I can't do this. I can't do this. You have to take these. And I I have these documents in front of me and I shove them in my pocket or something. I don't know what I did. And we pull up and we're sitting for a long time, hours until they're finishing the car in front of us. And again, the Soviet way is to get no information. I might've asked, excuse me. And they just ignore us because it's not our turn. They're dealing with the other car and you just have to sit there. And my sister and I are sitting there quietly getting more nervous and more nervous as time goes on, how this is going to play out and if we're actually going to get all this stuff through. Now, I had taken the Red Wave album cover before I left 
and was trying to figure out how I'm going to get this album in without them seeing it. I go into Tower Records and I look in the bins and I find some obscure double album of some country band I'd never heard of. And I go and I buy it. I take out the two vinyl albums and I kind of fit the Red Wave album cover in between this double album. And I go and ask the guy if he could shrink wrap it for me. I knew from my friends that had worked at the store before they did that. If you returned an album because it was scratched or something, they would just take it in the back, re-shrink wrap it and sell it. You know, and of course he denies that. No, 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 we don't do that. And I said, yes, you do. I finally pull out the Red Wave album and explain to him what I am doing and that these are underground bands that can't perform and can't release albums. And I have this album coming out. I need to get it in shrink wrapped so I can take it back and show them. And the guy's mouth dropped. It was a young guy who thought it was like the gnarliest thing he'd ever heard and said, sure, I'll go back and shrink wrap it. So that's one of the things that we have in the car. And that's what I'm most thinking about because again, I just want to get this album cover and to show them it's happening and see the surprise, happy looks on their face. Finally, it's our turn. They make us take everything out. They start looking through everything. They're taking the car apart. I guess people sometimes are bringing drugs in through Helsinki, and that's why they they start taking the car apart. So looking for drugs. Um, for me, I'm I'm rambling again about all the equipment, why I have it. I'm sorry, I have a tour in France after my musicians couldn't take it. I have to take it. I need a blah blah blah. And again, I'm annoying. They're, they're not paying attention to me rambling. They're just being annoyed by it. My sister disappears. I don't really understand where she is. But all of a sudden, he picks up this country album. And the guy has it in his hands. And I can see his hands on this album, turning it inside out. You know, he can't open it because it's shrink wrap. And I just keep thinking, no, 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 no. Please, please, please. I need this album. And I say to him, rambling a mile a minute. Oh my God, isn't it funny? I saw, found this country album, this double album in Finland. How weird. Why would they be selling some country album of an American band? And I don't know, blah, 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 blah. I can see the guy is just so annoyed with this shrieky voice rambling on that he finally puts it down and goes on to something else. So for me, I take a breath because this is what's important. I turn and I see my sister being walked out by this woman in her military garb. And my sister looks very angry. She comes back and I say, what happened? And she doesn't answer me. And she just looks like she's fuming. Finally, the customs guy say, go. I mean, if you could see the pile of stuff taken out of this car, even parts of the car, the two of us, it's like a cartoon in fast motion or just throwing everything in, trying to squeeze it in and parts and whatever. And off we go. I am beaming because I'm going to see Yuri, who by now we are quite the couple. My friends, I'm going to show them the album. Next thing I know, my sister breaks down crying that she was strip searched. And for me not to ever ask her to carry anything again, thank goodness she had given me those papers. Um, And she was horrified. I just started cracking up. I don't know why. I, I, I just, all the nervous energy of going through that. I just started cracking up. The next thing you know, she's cracking up. Then there's just two smiles on our faces and we are just zipping as fast as we can to Leningrad. Incredible, incredible story that. Now, in in Leningrad, you you get questioned by a couple of Soviet sociology professors. Well, they, 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 they say they're interested in what you're doing. Yes, as I said earlier, that the way the KGB and the FBI set up meetings with me, and that it was in these securitist kind of made up ways. So how it started is Boris said to me one day, this is before Red Wave, Boris says to me, you know, the KGB is asking about you again, in the middle of his puffing of a cigarette, just nonchalant. Oh, the KGB is asking about you. My heart dropped. By now, I'm completely in love with Yuri. I'm embedded as part of this whole Russian Tusovka, spending a lot of time doing nothing. I'm part of the whole scene. I am scared to death to hear these words. The KGB is asking about you. And I said, what? What? I said, how would you know that? He says, oh, yeah, I was meeting with them. I said, you're meeting with the KGB? He says, oh, yeah, they, they call all the musicians every once in a while. And some of them hang up on him. You know, some just don't show up. 
He says, but some meet with them and I meet with them because I have nothing to hide. He says, some of them even ask me for my autographs. And I'm thinking, what? What? Really? How, what, what kind of bizarre life is this? So when he tells me they're asking about me, I said, I said, what, what do they say? He said, they're just asking if I know you and they're asking me, you know, what you do. And I said, what do you say? And he says, I tell them the truth that you just love our music and you like hearing our music. So then I think, okay, well, I, I have nothing to hide either like Boris. So I want to meet them. And I said, Boris, can, can you, because I've already done this with the FBI. I'm not afraid to meet them because I have my truth and I can, I have nothing to hide. It's all about the music. So I said, Boris, can you ask them if there's any way I can come and meet with them and explain to them what I'm doing? And he says, I, I guess. So sometime later, days or weeks later, it might've been even on the next trip. I don't know. Boris says, uh, I talked to the KGB about you meeting them. I said, oh, okay, what? He says, I got to tell you, I've never seen them like this. He said that when he asked if I could come meet them, now they were in this big building. It was called the big house. It was this big white house. And it happened to be right across the street from Tamor Novikov, one of the underground artists, uh, studio where we all hung out. And they had this big, huge painting of this angry man with glasses over this window. And I remember tomorrow in Africa lifting it up saying, see that building there? That's the KGB, KGB building. So it's so ironic that it was so close to so much. There were underground performances there, everything. So I knew the building and Boris said, oh my God, they freaked out, like put their hands up. No, 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 don't let her come here. You know, like they're scared of the big bad American. It was so bizarre. But I was disappointed because I was afraid that if I couldn't explain to them that what I was doing was for good, it was for positive, you know, um, a bridge between America and, and Russians, I thought I'm going to be in trouble. My visa is going to be declined. So Boris knew, you know, that I was upset that I couldn't meet him, but there was nothing that could be done. A little bit later, Boris says to me, hey, there's two sociology professors from the university that asked if they could interview about what Americans do with their free time. And there was something about the way that he asked me or some look on his face that I thought it was the KGB, but I was already part of Russian life there and you didn't ask any more questions than you needed to know. So I didn't ask Boris, well, is this the KGB? I just said, sure. You know, I was happy to, to talk about, you know, what I was involved with and all these great guys to anybody. So I said, sure. But I thought that it's, there was a sense that this was a KGB. Again, I, I was thinking good if they are, because I want to tell them. So they decide to meet at the Europeska hotel, which I stayed at quite often. It was right near Nevsky prospect. It was one of the interest hotels. And I remember being in the lobby and thinking, you know, this, this, this is, this could be dangerous. And I started to get nervous and I see these two guys walk towards me and they looked like you would assume um, professors would look a little disheveled, not what I thought, which was the KGB in these, you know, cleaned form fitted suits and, and, and very, you know, shortcut hair and everything. They looked a little disheveled, but I actually had this moment where I thought, you know, maybe I made up this whole narrative in my head and this is, this is actually going to be two professors that want to know about Americans. So I kind of took a breath and they came up. Hi, Joanna. Nice to meet you. And I said, oh, thank you. Nice to meet you. And they said, you know, so we have more privacy and quiet. We have a room on the second floor. And I thought, OK. And I followed them up to the second floor and they opened this door. And there's this big round table filled with food and decanters with, 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 with wine and vodka and beautiful China dishes and crystal. And it looked like a scene out of a movie from the czar period. And I kind of feel like I got hit in the stomach and I thought, Oh boy, we're not in Kansas anymore. And I of course immediately knew this was the KGB and I just was amazed at the, you know, decadence of this table and this food. <laughs> you know, the minute that I had that feeling, there was no question that the two guys knew, I knew they were KGB. 
And they knew that I knew that they knew I was KGB, but this is part of the game. I had the same thing with the FBI, and this is part of this whole game of how they work. So I still sit down, and they knowing that I know, that they know that they're KGB, you think they would just cut to the chase and say, your behavior looks like you're a spy. What are you doing here? No. They have to play this whole game of we're professors, and we want to know, what do Americans do you know, on the weekends when they don't work? What are they like? You know, the same thing as the KG, as the FBI, these same mundane opener questions that, of course, turn into, do you meet with any Russian immigrants in the States? Have you met any other organizations or thing that works with immigrants? Again, they know the whole time that I know what they want to ask me. They know I know that I know what they want to ask me. But it's just this this ridiculous kind of, you know, circular game. And, you know, I just played it because I, I, you know, I just thought if they thought how, if they saw how genuine I was and how much I was in love with the Russian people and in Leningrad in general, I love the city of Leningrad. I thought they would clearly see she's not a threat. So, Again, I went through the whole meeting. I don't know how it ended, probably the same way, you know, just saying, okay, thank you. If we have any other questions, maybe we'll call you in the future. And, you know, I thought it, I thought it might make a difference. In the meantime, Yuri proposes to you and your wedding is planned, but, th- but there's a problem. So what happens? I'm interviewed by the FBI. I'm interviewed by the KGB. The Red Wave album comes out. It gets tons and tons of press internationally. I am certain I'm not going to get back in Russia. The album comes out in June. I easily get a visa in August. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I come back in 1986, August, and the energy in Russia has changed. This is now full height Gorbachev's glass nose. And everything seems freer. Not only my rocker friends, the average public is walking around and they're now laughing in public and they're being more boisterous. And I really can feel like, wow, things are changing. So I thought, well, I got a visa because they must have realized from all the Western press where I'm just gushing about how cool the Russians are and the parts of Russian life that I find interesting and that we have in common. They must have finally figured out that what I'm doing is a positive thing. So I go in August. I come back. I get another visa in October. And I think, you know, good. It's over. It's all good. And I come in October and I hear that Melodia, uh, the record label, and VOP, which is the publishing company in the Soviet Union. So mainly VOP, the publishing company has asked the musicians to sign a paper against me saying that they didn't authorize me to take their music, that I stole it, and I put it out illegally in the West. And I was thinking, ah, again, this scenario happens time and time again, that you think one thing has changed, and meanwhile you get shown time and time again that it hasn't changed. So I run to Moscow to meet with Vop to explain to them about the album. I had had a couple of meetings with them to try to get some deals going with bringing Bowie to Russia, trying to get Boris maybe to America. And what I learned is that when something's illegal or something's underground in Russia, it can quite easily be allowed to happen if it has to do with money. So if I was going to get Bowie to come to Russia, but, you know, it's going to cost a lot of money for him to do a concert in Russia, they would be open to that. So I felt very above board in October of 1986, ran to them to meet with them, uh, you know, to sit across from these stone faced, you know, uh, bureaucratic uh, employees of VOP that were very upset about the Red Wave album. And we go into the same game as the FBI and the KGB where they're saying, you stole this album. And I'm saying, no, I didn't. The musicians, they were so great and they were part of it. And again, they knew the musicians were part of it. But it's the same kind of game that they're not going to back down. So I finally say, 
You're absolutely right. I stole the music. It was me. They didn't know. I'm so sorry. I was just trying to do something good. I'm so sorry. Um, it was all, all for a good purpose. So they say, oh, thank you so much for telling us the truth. So now we need you to sign this paper saying that you admit that you did this illegal and you violated copyright laws. You're going to have to pay a fee. And I said, yes, yes, yes. At this time, they wore me down. I just wanted to get out of there and get back to my friends. What was interesting is the minute that I signed that paper, their whole attitude changed. And they, again, were back to being my best friends. Okay, let's work on this Bowie thing. And let's work on getting Boris to America. And we hear you also have written songs. So maybe we can get you to get your album out on Melodia. Everything changed. So after October of 1986, it's the first time ever that me always being fearful of getting my visa declined is gone. I am now an official person in Russia and all of these projects are in negotiations. I come for about five weeks. I can now stay longer uh, in December and Yuri and I uh, have been together in October. I'm living in his house. He asked me to marry him. Um, in the Russian way, which is just out of the blue, we're sitting at home and he says, I want you to be my wife. And I was, you know, taken back and just then so happy. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. And, you know, we have a big party with all our friends and everyone's getting drunk and everyone's so exciting. I'm going to officially become one of, one of this whole group because I was really already part of it by then. And I'm in there in December of 1986 and everything is amazing. I'm even by now, being able to um, participate, getting on stage and singing with some of the bands where I couldn't earlier, where the KGB would threaten a concert, the, cancel the concerts if they heard I was going to get up and, and be part of any song. I really was above board and everything was amazing. My friends were all happy because since Red Wave, the Soviets, so they wouldn't be embarrassed by all the Western press, quickly allowed all the underground music to become above board and the bands were being played on the radio. They were allowed to all of a sudden tour all over Russia. They were allowed to record in studio. So they were happier than they had ever been. Boris had gotten a contract with, with Melodia to release one of his albums. And it was really historic because Boris and some of the other bands had been asked before to become official, but they turned it down because to them, it wasn't about money. It was about freedom to do their music the way they wanted to do it. So they always turned it down. But Boris, after Red Wave, had been offered to put it, one of his albums out on Melodia, 100% how Boris gave it to them with no censorship. So this was a game changer. And this is what the bands had always wanted. So December of 86 couldn't have been a better time. The musicians are happy. I'm happy. I'm going to marry the love of my life. It just, everything was perfect. As I'm leaving in January of 1987, I'm at the airport and I have so much on my mind because I had my wedding. I'm going home for a month to get my dress, get all my family and get back for this amazing wedding. And Life Magazine wants to film it and NBC News wants to come and film the wedding. And I have these projects going with Bowie and then with, with other people. Everything is happening. My last memory at the airport is Yuri trying to take a moment to give me a big hug and a big kiss and to just look me in the eyes as his future wife and just take this moment. And I'm being very much me where I'm multitasking and I'm so on a, on a high. I'm kind of, Yuri, Yuri, I'll be back. I'm gonna be back in a month. And I kind of kiss him quickly and I walk away and not really take that moment to connect with him. And I'm on seventh heaven. And, and I feel like I'm in seventh heaven and I'm on a high and I get on that plane and the world is mine. Of course, I get back and in three weeks after, you know, getting my, you know, uh, designer dress made by, by a designer and getting everything ready to go back, my visa's dec declined and my whole life is taken away from me and it's devastating. And on that cliffhanger, don't miss the third part of Joanna's conversation, which will be live next week. There's further information such as photos and videos in our episode notes, which will show as a link in your podcast app. Now, this show wouldn't exist without our generous Patreons, so I want to thank one and all of them for their support. 
You can very easily become a Patreon by going to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. And you can also join our Facebook group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War conversation. Thanks very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. Thanks for listening right through to the end. I really appreciate it. And maybe check out our store and see if you can find the ideal gift for the Cold War enthusiast in your life. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash store. Thanks for listening.